Yeah, this 20th chapter of the book of Acts is just packed with stuff that is important to touch on. I am just trying to skim the surface a little bit. I want to remind us by way of review that Paul is on the ending of his third missionary journey. He is going to be taking the ship back toward the area of Jerusalem, the area of Israel. Before he goes that way, there he stops in Asia Minor and calls for the Ephesian elders. Ephesus was a little bit of an inland city, but the town of Miletus was the seaport city to Ephesus, as is found in verse number 17. And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, You know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. And I tried to talk in the vein of the trials and tribulations that one can just automatically expect to come along if you're going to serve the Lord. The devil is going to be against it. He's not going to help you. Beware if the world, along with the energizing of the devil, tries to help you in the work of the Lord. The devil's got a sinister plan down the road somewhere. It's a trap. Don't fall into it. We must be careful of that. And we have here Paul talks about his consistency in the Lord. What manner I have been with you at all seasons from the first day that I came into Asia. And he talks about the purpose of his trip. He talks about the purpose of his life. He talks uh, about what was behind his going forth and what motivated him. Uh, what pressed his button, as it were. And it is, in verse 19, serving the Lord. Serving the Lord. Serving the Lord. I cannot stress too much, brothers and sisters, the importance of serving the Lord. Would God that God's people could get through their heads and into their hearts that it's about the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not about us. It is the serving of the Lord that counts. Paul said, serving the Lord, serving the Lord with all humility, of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the line and weight of the Jews. And I kind of hooked to that verse up with the 29th verse where Paul said, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own self shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn every one night and day with tears. And I talked in the vein about the biggest problems that come along in churches usually are not from without, but from within. And usually they're not great doctrinal problems. Usually they're little piles of beans here and there that aren't going to amount to anything after it's all said and done. We Christians need to be careful about that. And I think the anecdote is for all of us to keep our heart set on the motivation, our heart straight, our eyes on the Lord. It is, and again I repeat, serving the Lord. That's what it's about. Serving the Lord. Serving the Lord. Not our getting served which is all too prominent in this day that we live in, our wanting to get something out of it. And I, I can understand that. I mean, hey, when I go to church, I want to get something out of it. Don't you guys? I, I mean, I do. I, I want to be fed the Word of God. I, I want to go away with my soul hopefully thrilled in Jesus Christ. I want to get something out of it. But... Uh, May I suggest, if you want to get something out of it, serve the Lord. Serving the Lord. That's where it's at. Serving the Lord. 
And so we have him telling the people here, uh, the serving of the Lord uh, being a primary thing is something that I think will keep many churches together. If my eyes are fixed on the Lord instead of the brother or sister that's in the pew beside me, and I thank God that I'm not like that, or, or uh, uh, well, you can take it anywhere you want to go, but... Uh, and now your brothers and sisters in Christ are not going to be perfect. This may come as a real shocker, but the preacher's not going to be perfect. I mean, that's the way it is. I hate to disappoint. I hate to ruin anybody's image of me up here, which I got a feeling I didn't ruin anybody's image of me uh, up here when I say that. Uh, but listen, brothers and sisters, we're all a work in progress. Hopefully, a work in progress. But I want to say this. It's important for us to keep our minds upon the main thing, and the main thing is serving the Lord. You serve the Lord, and uh, I'd like to say that I'm on solid theological ground when I say you won't be left out because God will not be a debtor to any man. You're not going to outserve the Lord. In fact, if you served the Lord all your life and didn't get anything out of it except salvation and a home in heaven for all eternity, you would have gotten the best end of the deal by far. So Paul says, serving the Lord. And then he goes on to say, I'm in verse number 20 now for this evening's lesson. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. I want to stop there. How that I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. We need to guard our speech. We need to be careful with our language one toward another. The Apostle Paul said here, how that I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. Now that tells me that he may have kept back some stuff. That tells me he may have kept some stuff to himself. He may have known some stuff on this fellow over there or that person over there, but the telling of it may not have been constructive to the serving of the Lord. And since the serving of the Lord was the main thing, the Apostle Paul kept that back to himself. You don't have to tell everything you know. A lot of times the Pharisee in us tries to pop out. Have you ever been amazed at how easy it is for the Pharisee to come out in us? The Apostle Paul said, and I want to mention this again, how that I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. You know, when we have something to say, I think a lot of times we need to ask ourselves the question, is this going to be constructive for the work of Jesus Christ? Is this going to be helpful towards his work? Now that doesn't mean you just have to stick your head in the sand and go along with everything. You guys know me. I'm a fundamentalist, so to speak. I'm one of those guys who believes in standing for the truth and standing for that which is right. But I'm not for going around chopping off heads just for the sake of chopping off heads. Sometimes it seems to me like there's a certain mindset within fundamentalism whereby there are groups who, who want to uh, uh, tear down the next group just to show that they're the top group. That may not be the best way to explain it, but that's the way it seems to me anyway. And the Apostle Paul says, how that I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. We really need to pray for the Lord to set a watch at the door of my mouth. Amen? I'll repeat my spill that I go through every once in a while. How many of you has ever gotten in trouble by your mouth? Most of us get more trouble out of our own mouth than we do just about anything else. And then you know how I usually say how many of you, and nobody ever raises their hand on these kind of things here. But I go on to say how many of you ever just said I'm just going to keep my big mouth shut from now on? And then I'm prone to say, how many of you ever carried through and kept your big mouth shut? <laughs> well, I did till the next opportunity. <laughs> 
Uh, what I wanted to point out, please folks, as Paul said, how that I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. Now, I want to be careful. This, this is a loaded subject in some ways because there's a time to rebuke, right? There's a time to exhort. There, there can be no question about that. Now, the Apostle Paul did it. He said, I withstood Peter to his face. Remember that one? There is a time for that. There's no doubt about it. And yet, uh, hey, it's all right to be nice to your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ too. It's all right to try to have an attitude of trying to build one another in the Lord. It's all right to have an attitude of trying to encourage one another in the Lord once in a while. Paul said, how that I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. Sometimes I think some of us would do well by trying to think how we could be more of an encouragement to somebody than we could to to be a demolition expert uh, in somebody else's character, whatever the case may be. You know, folks, it's all right to try to build one another up. Uh, you guys know Mrs. Mannix. Uh, if there were a gift of uh, encouragement, I would say that Mrs. Mannix would have that gift. I'll never forget. Uh, Brother Gary, you remember when we tore out the platform on the old building? Remember that? You got to remember. I mean, you you, you, you fix it. We forget that. But, uh, you guys remember before the building burned down, we were still over on Houston Street, no? You can't tell me. Sorry. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. You guys remember how the, before the building burned down, we wanted to change that platform up? And uh, we wanted to do it all in, uh, in a week's time between Sunday night after church and the next Sunday morning. Remember, we wanted it back together. And remember how we built that thing modularly, uh, kind of outside the auditorium, had everything ready to go. Sunday night after church, we started tearing that thing out. Got men in there, and I mean we tore up. It's easy to tear stuff up. <laughs> Get a bigger sledgehammer. Don't tell my nephew how. Huh? Uh, <clears throat> it's easy to tear stuff up. I'll never forget that Monday morning. Uh, some of the ladies wanted to help out too, so some of them would come along and they'd help clean up. Uh, and uh, It's good to try to keep stuff clean. We dirtied it up just as fast as they cleaned it up. But... <laughs> They'd fix a little stuff for us and bring us water and so on. And Mrs. Mannix was walking through there. And uh, I looked at her and, man, it was a mess. And I said, uh, what do you think, Mrs. Mannix? I think I just about had her. But she thought for a minute or two. And uh, she said, well, it has potential. <laughs> I want to tell you folks, the Apostle Paul kind of gives us a lesson here in our relationships one with another that a lot of us could use. He said, how that I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. Now sometimes that which is profitable is going to hurt. Sometimes that which is profitable is going to sting. Like a little bit of medicine that you pour into an open wound can sometimes uh, sizzle or burn, whatever. But it's good for you. Uh, so, sometimes that which is profitable is liable to hurt the feelings a little bit. And a lot of times we can't get past the hurt feelings. If somebody gives you constructive criticism, try to get past the hurt feelings and do the best you can with it. Do what you can. If there is an adjustment that needs to be made, do so. I just like this phrase that comes to our attention here, how Paul says, I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. And I do think that he meant 
He was trying to build them up doctrinally. He was trying to get the lost saved. He was trying to correct the course in some of the lives. Hey, wouldn't that be included? Uh, because we tend to get off course. We tend to get a little worldliness that slips in every once in a while. And I think Paul addressed all that stuff. But I think Paul was careful in how he did it. And I think that when he says that he was with them in humility of mind and many tears and testings, it tells us that he really cared about the people and he didn't just go in on a white horse swinging a sword or anything that stuck its head up. He was there to try to build up the people of God. How that I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. And he goes on importantly to say, but have showed you I want to stop there just a moment. The Apostle Paul not only preached it, he lived it. Now he does go on to say, if you look in that verse, and have taught you publicly and from house to house. But I like for us to get a hold of that first part. But have showed you. Have you ever heard the statement, many things are caught, not taught? There's some truth to that, folks. I remember one time up in Denver, the young people at the church my dad pastored rented a skating rink. They wouldn't go down there skating uh, on uh, just uh, any time. They, they either wanted the whole rink because of the kind of music and the kind of riffraff and so on. Um, so the church rented the whole skating rink and um, went down there. And I was just a kid, but me being the preacher's son, one of the perks was to get to go along on the out, uh, outings of the young people. I mean, when you're the preacher's kid, you can't tell you no. The preacher's taking you. And uh, my older sisters, Bernie and Bonnie, were there, and my older sister, Noni, was there, and... Those uh, young people, uh, all the all the uh, people. There were a couple, three different churches there that night for that uh, uh, skating rink outing, and they were all having a good time. And I wanted to have a good time too. And I wanted to skate. I was going to skate. I'd never been on a pair of skates before in my life. Uh, so I got out there on that floor. Now a lot of you guys probably don't remember the old time skating rinks, but they had those hardwood floors. How many of you have ever been skating on four wheel skates and a hardwood floor? Yeah, I had a lot of fun in, uh, out there. And um, they get to going around there. And um, my older sisters were trying to teach me how to skate. And um, they had all kinds of advice. Put the skates on, do this, do that. I couldn't get the hang of it. I could, I, I could manage to get up with the skates underneath me. But when I tried to skate, part of me went one way and another part of me went another way. I couldn't get the hang of it. I, I just couldn't get it. And, and my older sisters, you guys know kind of how my older sisters are. You got to protect your little brother, make sure. All right, they they try to to push me, hold me up, and, and so they'd push me a little while. And once the momentum from the push ran out, I ran out. I just couldn't get the hang of it. And finally, I gave up. I said, "This is not my calling." I didn't say that, but that's what it amounted to. And uh, my dad, uh, of course, he was older at that time because I was the son of his old age. My dad had to be at least 45 at that time. I mean, you know. You, you, yeah, you, yeah, you had to be extra. I mean, uh, but, but to me, just a youngster, you know, that was way on up there. <laughs> Like a bunch of you kids are thinking out there right now. Yeah, you brother, we're cool. Are you talking about the older? Just look at you. Well, uh, be kind to the elderly because you're headed there if the Lord doesn't come. 
<laughs> Let me remind you. But after after the uh, skating rink outing was over, and uh, everybody was taking their skates off, well, my dad decided he was going to skate, and I was somewhat fearful um, for the old guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh no but uh, my dad got out there on those skates of his and uh, I watched my dad skate and it seemed like he just knew how to kind of shove off so to speak and he'd put that foot out there and thrust his body forward and I watched him do that for a little bit and I said that's how you do it and I went and put on a pair of skates again, and I started skating. That started uh, another factor in my life. Uh, but be that as it may, I use that as an illustration to show that a lot of things are caught, not taught. And Paul said, I have showed you. Now I want to ask you guys here tonight, and I'm sorry for the swiftness with which the time goes by, but I want to ask you guys here tonight, how many of you are a living example of the life in Jesus Christ? Do you remember in Matthew, please, chapter number 5, beginning in verse 14, where the Bible says, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. That kind of tends to make me believe God is telling his people, I, I want you to be on a hill. I want your light to shine. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. I often think to myself, I've wondered anyway, that business about glorifying our Father which is in heaven. Uh, does that mean others that see us glorify our Father which is in heaven? Or does it mean we glorify our Father which is in heaven by letting our light shine? And I have to tell you, I've come to the conclusion that the weight on that verse is we glorify our Father in heaven when we let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works. That's glorifying to our Father which is in heaven. And I believe that it is important for God's people to try to get a hold of the business that showing is a lot of times more important than talking. I've asked you about if you've ever heard that statement, caught versus taught. Here's another one. You may have heard the statement, do as I say, not as I do. How many of you have ever heard that statement? Ah, oh, okay. Well, uh, now i got to tell you, um, there, I think there's some merit in that statement. No doubt about it. Uh, I remember when Paul was growing up. I, uh, I'd always hoped... That, that Paul would uh, uh, turn out, uh, let's see, how can I say this? Um, well, better than me. Uh, don't misunderstand me. I, but I, 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 come on, parents, we want better for our kids, don't we? And uh, we know all of our own wicked ways and thoughts and so on. Uh, we want our kids, I think, to be better. And I had wanted Paul to come out. And I remember a lot of times uh, trying to give instruction um, and even at times telling uh, Paul, uh, uh, Dad doesn't always do everything right. You, you can't always follow Dad. But you need to try to follow the Lord. So there is merit in that statement do as I say and not as I do. However, let me ask you this. In many cases, is not the person going to put more weight on what we do rather than what we say? Now, I tried to tell Paul constantly, uh, son, um, 
look to Jesus Christ. Uh, not your dad. I think uh, Marcia can verify this for me because I wanted Paul to grow up to count for the Lord. And I felt he could do a better job of it if he kept his eyes on Christ and not on his dad. Now don't misunderstand me. I did not want to alleviate myself of the responsibility that was mine to live an example before my son. And parents, I believe that is a good thing to consider. But I want to say this, that I don't care how good a parent you are, you're going to mess up somewhere. Right? I know I was talking to a mother one time in Elfrida where I pastored. and I was talking to her about her soul and I asked her where she thought she'd go when she died. She said, well, I, I think I'll go to heaven. And I said, upon you base that. And I, I didn't say it in a smarty way. I asked her honestly, upon what are you basing your hope of going to heaven? And she said, well, I'm not a bad person. I'm a good mother. And that opened the door for me when she said she was a good mother because she had three or four little kiddos there running around, all of them wanting mother's attention at the same time. And uh, I, uh, I said, well now, uh, listen, have there ever been times when you've ever figured that you have uh, maybe failed and uh, wondered if you were a good mother? <laughs> she smiled and grinned. Well, yes, that's true. Well, that's the way it is with parents. Do I not speak the truth? I don't care wh how good a parent you are. You're still a sinner. Hopefully a sinner saved by grace, but you're still a sinner. Amen. And God knows better how to raise your kid than you do. Amen. God knows better how to raise my uh, son than I did. And I, I wanted Paul to keep his eyes on the Lord. There's the two sides of the coin, if I might so say, brothers and sisters. The one of them is that we must understand that ultimately keep your eyes fixed on God. But the other side of that coin is this. I'm going to do what I can to try to help keep the eyes fixed on God. And I believe it's important for us to get a hold of those concepts. The Apostle Paul said, I have showed you. And then he said, after I showed you and I have taught you publicly and from house to house. Now it seems to me like if I put together the work of the ministry and the serving of the Lord from verse number 19, that I get here uh, showing teaching and doing it publicly and from house to house, right? And would that not be a good synopsis of the work of the church of Jesus Christ? Serving the Lord. And there's one more thing down in verse number 24, and then I'm going to have to quit for this evening. But in verse number 24, But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry. And the ministry. I'd like to say serving the Lord and the ministry is, is just involved with that showing and teaching publicly and from house to house. And a lot of times I think church have, churches have been detoured in the day that we live in from just the simplicity that is in Christ and showing and teaching publicly and from house to house. Oh, one more thing. I know I said I was going to quit after that, but preachers can't do that because they're too used to saying that and then not doing it. So if I did it, it'd give everybody here a heart attack, so I won't do that. I, I must say this. What are we supposed to be teaching? The Word of God. What did Paul tell Timothy? Remember, and Timothy was the one left at Ephesus. Right? And isn't he talking to the Ephesian elders here? And what did Paul tell Timothy? Preach the Word. So if you want to have something, put it, put it together in this way. Serving the Lord and the ministry, show it publicly and from house to house. And teach it publicly and from house to house. Hey, is that not a good 
summary of the work of the church of Jesus Christ. Let's keep our eyes on that. Let's keep our minds on that. Let's keep our hearts fixed upon that. And let us do the best we can to be the church that Jesus Christ would have us to be. With that then I'll close the lesson this evening and we'll come back to Acts chapter number 20 next Wednesday night. Do you have prayer requests that you would like to make known tonight before we go to the Lord in prayer? Please speak up.